Welcome to Career Choices, the show where you'll learn about different professions so you can make informed decisions on your career choices. I'm your host, Elizabeth Gia. Our guest, Dr. Lori Winger, is an ophthalmologist, also known as an eye doctor. Besides checking your vision, she takes care of the total health of your eyes. Dr. Wenger graduated from George Washington University School of Medicine and Health Sciences. She has been practicing since 1999 and has been recognized as a top doctor by Washingtonian Magazine in 2012 and top ophthalmologist for Top Doctor in 2015. Dr. Wenger believes in giving back to the community. She's the recipient of the 2013 Mary C. Jackson Good Works Done Well Award. She also participates in Eye Care America, providing free eye care for the medically underserved. Let's welcome Dr. Lori Wenger. Thank you so much for being here today. Thank you for having me. So let's start with the very basic. What is an ophthalmologist? How is it different from an optometrist? So an ophthalmologist is a physician. Uh, we go to medical school and then specialize afterwards in uh, in medical and surgical care of the eye. Uh, an optometrist goes to optometry school, so they are not physicians. Mm -hmm. um, I kind of liken it to the difference between an orthopedic surgeon and a podiatrist or a chiropractor. Okay. Um, sort of a similar kind of relationship. Um, we go to four years of college, mm -hmm. uh, and then afterwards four years of medical school, and then there's four years of residency afterwards. So when you were becoming a doctor in medical school, how did you choose ophthalmology as the path? Um, so mine developed over a course of many, many years. I grew up in a household where my father was an ophthalmologist, mm -hmm. and I worked in his office as a teenager, mm -hmm. uh, performing some of the technical aspects of it, and not really having any clue as to what I was doing in terms of how it related to the medical profession. Um, but I always liked uh, math and science mm -hmm. and sort of went to college maybe c considering that I would go to medical school, uh, but not necessarily. Okay. And then I decided to take, take the plunge. Okay. <laughs> so you are the first physician that I'm interviewing on Career Choices, mm -hmm. so thank you. And for our audience who is interested in going into medicine, Let's talk more of the specifics of that process. You just mentioned a few sure. things. Certainly, as a pre-med student, there are certain majors that may help in undergraduate and then applying for the GMAT to get into medical school. So tell us about your own experience in that path. So my own experience, again, I really enjoyed math and science. So going to college, I picked a major that was science-based. I was a genetics major, oh, which required not only some basic science courses, but some more advanced science courses. And that fulfilled all the requirements I need for going to medical school. However, those are definitely not the requirements. Mm -hmm. And honestly, looking back, I do regret not taking more of the liberal arts courses um, because a lot of the courses in this, uh, some of the science courses, you repeat in medical school anyway. Mm, okay. uh, so I think I would have, uh, I would have preferred to branch out a little bit and always wish that I could go back and do that. Okay. <laughs> and then after that, the medical school program, you have residency and fellowship. Correct. So what does that entail? How are they different? So for ophthalmology, uh, after you do four years of medical school and you apply uh, to your residency, for ophthalmology, the first year mm -hmm. of the four years is an internship. Mm -hmm. And you have your choice. You can do uh, an, either a medical or a surgical internship. So you can spend a year doing internal medicine or you can do a year doing uh, general surgery. Okay. For me, uh, I chose to do uh, internal medicine because there, in ophthalmology there are a lot of um, medical diagnoses that we that we detect um, and I really enjoyed that part of it learning hypertension diabetes taking care of all these kind of patients mm -hmm. um, and surgery for me was going to be more general surgery whereas in ophthalmology we practice microsurgery okay. so it's completely different and I felt that this was more helpful to me to, to proceed with the internal medicine part of it. And then after that, it's three years just of ophthalmology. 
Okay, when you say three years, that's the fellowship portion? That's the residency. Oh, that is the residency. And okay. so once you complete your three years of residency, uh, you're an ophthalmologist. Mm -hmm. you, some people decide to go further and subspecialize. And in ophthalmology, there are many different choices. And we have sort of the front to the back of the eye is all a different compartment. Uh, so you can be a glaucoma specialist. You can be a neuro-ophthalmologist, an oculoplastic surgeon. Wow. Uh, a retina specialist, a uveitis specialist, an ocular oncologist. So there are many, a cornea specialist, um, many, many choices, uh, which requires an additional two, two to three years, depending on what you decide to do. Mm -hmm. um, when you complete your initial three years, you can uh, practice comprehensive ophthalmology. Mm -hmm. And this allows you to do surgery, although some people um, decide when they go on to fellowship as a neuro-ophthalmologist or even a, um, a medical retina doctor, they don't practice surgery. Mm -hmm. um, and that's just uh, their, their, their option. Exactly. So for yourself, mm -hmm. what happened after residency? Um, or where after, did you first right. yeah. So after residency, I, um, I was happy with what I had completed and was yeah. ready to kind of move on with my life. And um, so I, I do uh, cataract surgery mm -hmm. um, and treat all kinds of diseases of the eye. Wonderful. And I believe you do practice locally here in the county? Correct. So are there any certifications or state licenses that you needed to pass or obtain? Absolutely. So uh, you do need to have a state license. Mm -hmm. um, and Med uh, Maryland has certain requirements, um, the continuing medical education um, as well as ethical requirements. And then beyond that, uh, you can elect to be board certified. Not okay. all doctors are, but you should always check to make sure your doctor is board certified. So in ophthalmology, uh, when you complete your residency, you can uh, go ahead and take a written test and then sit down. If you pass that, you can sit down for your oral examinations, which are pretty intense. That's for the board. That's for the board certification. Okay. And if you pass that, you're board certified. And the requirements require that we uh, get recertified every 10 years. Mm. So that requires an additional 250 hours of continuing medical education, um, as well as further testing uh, that we have to undergo and other sorts of learning um, opportunities that are required and assessments of how your practice is doing, uh, analyzing data to improve your practice. So about your practice, when you first started it, can you explain what that experience was like? Sure. So before I uh, joined my practice in Maryland, I was on staff um, at a hospital in New York um, where I completed my residency. And then I moved down here. Mm -hmm. And I joined my father in practice. He's an ophthalmologist as well. And so I continued to slowly build up my practice, initially by seeing emergency patients mostly, mm -hmm. um, and eventually word of mouth, and slowly building up my, my practice. I have a, uh, what I call low volume traditional family kind of practice, so we spend a lot of time with our patients. I'm very hands-on with my patients. And it takes time, took time to build, but it was worth the wait. Um, and I enjoy the interactions with my patients as well as being able to see multi, uh, it's a multi-generational practice as well. It's very special in that regard, I would imagine, Absolutely. your patients seeing it is a family practice. Yes. And when you say traditional, can you explain a little bit what does that mean, a traditional um, practice? I'd say it means that I see um, I, I've started with patients who were very young at the time when I started with them, and now they're either teenagers or even uh, out of college and have jobs, and I see their parents and their grandparents. And, uh, and again, patients come in, and we do a lot of work hands-on with, uh, uh, without a lot of technicians okay. uh, to do the work. And so I sort of see the patient from beginning to end and spend a lot of time uh, talking, listening, and, um, and hope, hopefully responding and having them walk out with a good outcome. So they, they get to know you, you get to know them. Exactly. And what's it like working with your father? Um, so it's from the beginning, it, uh, it was a great opportunity. I think we both provided something to the practice. He had the experience uh, and uh, the relationships with the patients. 
and coming on as a new doctor, I was certainly less experienced, but, uh, but also brought in some of the newer technologies that I had been taught in residency and um, was exposed to there and could share them with my patients. And, uh, and then we have a similar style of okay. dealing with our patients, and so it, it worked well. Very good. And you had mentioned earlier before that sir, this, the business model for your practice is also a little bit more special. Can Correct. you explain that? Absolutely. <laughs> so uh, I've been very fortunate to run mostly a fee-for-service practice, which is um, sort of old school, but it allows me to call the shots, um, to have, uh, again, fairly low volume, spending a lot of time with my patients, um, and not uh, being run by insurance companies to make decisions for me. Okay. That's very, it's interesting to see that. Right. Uh, it's unusual, mm -hmm. um, and I think because of the specialty that I'm in, um, it allows me those opportunities. You have more dedicated time. You Correct. don't have to be as rushed. Perhaps. Correct. Wonderful. So now it's time to take a break, but stay tuned. We'll be with us coming back from break, and we'll be talking more with Dr. Wenger. Thank you. Read to a child today and spark a lifetime of ambition. Up, college is hard. Down, those books are heavy. My sport is football, but my passion is education. Right up here. So every year I take promising high schoolers on a college tour to show them that higher education means a brighter future. <laughs> my name is Namdi Asamoah. I don't just wear the shirt, I live it. You can be a reader, tutor, or mentor too. Take the pledge at liveunited.org slash volunteer. Do you wear this? Nice. Oh! 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 Yes! Go! Yes! Yes! No! Come on! Oh. Oh. Oops. Yeah, sure. sure. Let's go. Let's go. Moms everywhere are finding ways to keep kids active and healthy. Works every time. Get ideas, get involved, get going at letsmove.gov. Welcome back to Career Choices. In today's program, we've invited Dr. Lori Wenger to talk about her career as an ophthalmologist. So, in our intro, we had mentioned that you received the Mary C. Jackson Good Works Done Well Award. It's an annual award given to people working or volunteering to benefit vulnerable populations to increase access to health care, quality health care, and in your case, eye, eye health care. So what is the importance of this type of volunteer work that you did? Um, so I've been doing this for many, many years. And it's a way to give back to the, to the community. Uh, we all have time in our schedules. Um, I'd say the biggest hurdle is to get the patients out to us. Um, you can see uh, what it takes for them to really get access to medical care. And so through this program in Montgomery County, uh, they arrange for patients to get access to subspecialties in the area, people who volunteer their time. So if a patient comes out to me, oftentimes they come uh, with their entire family because they can't get to us. Mm -hmm. Oftentimes they can't see, so they can't drive. And so when they come out to us, we try to do a comprehensive eye exam. And if they require surgery, uh, we have programs, or uh, this, this Project Access has a program where they work with uh, the local community hospitals or with my surgery center and arrange to uh, pay for surgery there. And mm -hmm. so the patient, I can do cataract surgery on these patients. In addition, if they have glaucoma or some other eye disease that requires long-term medication, uh, we will do whatever it takes to uh, 
talk with our uh, representatives in the pharmaceutical industry, mm -hmm. try to get free medication for them, get I them see. enrolled in programs where they can get ongoing medication. Um, and so it's, it's, a, it's a challenge, but it really, really helps these patients uh, live better lives. Um, especially when you, if you do cataract surgery on somebody, some of these patients have uh, very, very advanced cataracts where they sometimes mm -hmm. can't even see the eye chart across the room. So certainly they can't work, they can't drive, they can't be uh, productive members of society. And you know, one surgery or even two, if we can get both eyes done, will change their lives. Wonderful. Are they coming to you within the county or where are they coming from? So they are usually from countries all over the world, uh, especially uh, Africa, Haiti, some other countries. Um, and, uh, but they live in Montgomery County, and if they meet, re meet the requirements for this program, uh, then they have access to, to us. And the program name again is? Uh, Project Access, or uh, it's the um, coalition um, in Montgomery County. Wonderful. Yeah. And you had said so, then you did the cataract, you do the cataract surgery mm -hmm. for the eyes. And I noticed you also do some cosmetic or aesthetic treatments. Can you explain mm -hmm. what those are? Sure. Unrelated to my ophthalmology practice, it's sort of a fun part of my practice. Um, it makes people feel better. Um, I'm used to injecting uh, in and around the eye, so it's sort of a natural progression. And I do things like botulinum toxin injections. The Botox? Correct. Okay. Um, something also called Xeomin, which is a competing product, as well as uh, fillers. Okay. Um, and For uh, the youthful eye. Exactly. Aesthetic. Yes. Okay. Yes. So when you're interacting with these patients, it sounds like you're giving them not only eye care, but effectively um, a new lease on, on looking at life. Exactly. And what would you say would be good qualities of being a good ophthalmologist, a good doctor? Um, I think one of the most important things is to listen to your patients. Uh, give them the time to listen, so you need to be patient. Sometimes it takes a long time for patients to tell you the whole story. Um, they don't always know what's important, and, uh, or, or, or sometimes they don't think it's important and don't want to say anything at all or feel like they're wasting your time. So sometimes they come in just to talk about other, other things unrelated to ophthalmology as well, and that's just part of practice. Um, so you can be helpful in, in so many ways. and. I feel that most of my patients, when they walk out the door, are happier than they walk in, and that's why I love my practice so much. Yeah, so you had mentioned earlier, mm -hmm. you explain, even visually, what may happen during surgery, so that helps them to understand. Exactly. I think it's very important that patients are educated if they want to be, um, especially if they're ha undergoing surgery of some sort, so it's, it's very helpful to have visuals around. Um, so you have, what do you yes, have in your I, office? I have all kinds of uh, <laughs> things. I mean, we always have access to the internet and there's plenty of pictures on there. So I try to show people and I write down the name of their diagnosis because everybody wants to look it up, but I want to make sure <laughs> that they look up the right thing. Uh, the Academy of Ophthalmology has a, um, has a website so patients okay. can access lots of uh, very reputable information on there. And uh, it's called iSmart.org. iSmart.org. Yes, Very correct. Nice. And uh, but otherwise, I have um, some models of the eye in my office, and has lots of pieces. And I like to show patients exactly what I'm going to do on them if I'm going to perform surgery on the physical eye model. Exactly. Wonderful. Yes. So when you are interacting with your patients and working day in day out, what challenges are you facing? Um, Sometimes it's uh, a matter of giving patients advice and wanting them to follow. So compliance can be a factor um, because you want to, you might have instructions for a patient, but maybe there are too many instructions or maybe they don't have access or they can't get their medication. Mm -hmm. Maybe they don't know how to instill the drops in the eye. They, maybe mm -hmm. they don't like touching their eye um, or they're in a lot of pain. Um, so there's, uh, there's, Definitely many different hurdles uh, 
that and, and and I think also keeping in touch and making sure that your patients come back uh, or that you call them or they have access to call you. So mm -hmm. um, I think responding to your patients is very important. I always try to return a phone call as as soon as I can. What makes you most proud about doing ophthalmology? Um, I think restoring vision uh, really does change people's lives. Whether it's just with a good glasses prescription, contact lenses, um, or with cataract surgery. And cataract surgery has come a long way so that it is not only restoring a clear uh, visual pathway for the patient, but also we can do more advanced techniques now uh, with some of our implants to uh, restore very clear vision without glasses. So That's it's, wonderful. It's amazing. And you had mentioned earlier, certainly you can also assess through the eyes other health conditions. Correct. Can you explain those types of conditions? So there's uh, many different uh, things that we look for when we dilate somebody's eyes, um, and uh, including uh, high blood pressure, diabetes, um, autoimmune diseases, and so forth. So there are often times where we pick up things that people had no idea was going on in other organs in their body. Wow, very good. A window <laughs> into the body. It is. It is. <laughs> and so for our audience who may be interested in becoming a doctor, ophthalmologist, what advice would you like to share? I would say if you're interested at all in ophthalmology, um, it's great to talk to somebody who is because you don't have that opportunity when you are in medical school mm. um, to really try it out. It's, it, you really have to go out of your way to try it. I would say maybe you would get a week's worth of, of doing it. And that only allows you to sit in the back of somebody's office. Um, but it's a great career that combines medicine and surgery, long-term patient care, and very positive outcomes. When you say long-term patient care, some of your patients, how long have you had them come in back and forth? So all? since I've been in practice about 20 years, that's, uh, I've had some the entire time, um, and that's, that's it's great. really rewarding. Very good. And when it comes to you know, the progression of just the medical industry, how has medicine evolved to today for your practice? I'm sure it's different compared to when your father first started. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Ophthalmology is uh, a very uh, advancing field. There's a lot of technology. You know, people hear of lasers, all kinds of lasers. The implants have changed, so engineering is very important in ophthalmology. Mm -hmm. um, and it allows us to really provide amazing uh, eye care for patients. And you had said you pretty much treat young people to the elderly, mm -hmm. it's, it runs the gamut. Correct. Men yeah, and like women. Any age, mm -hmm. um, yes, any gender, <laughs> correct. How do you help those who may, may be a little bit uh, shy or nervous when they first come to the there, eye doctor? There are plenty of patients uh, which, who would prefer to go to the dentist. Oh, um, wow. Say. So some people, the, the eye just sets them off, so they may not come in very often. Um, but I think talking the patient through the examination, letting them know what to expect. Um, and for the most part, it's painless. And if you have the right touch, uh, you, can get th you can really get them through the entire exam and get what you need, to, uh, get the information you need out of them. Wonderful. Well, we have a little more time. Mm -hmm. So any last parting words uh, to encourage those or help those navigating medical schools? Um, so I would say, uh, it's, it's a long road, but it's a really rewarding uh, career. And so during the phase of uh, some of the initial science mm -hmm. courses, which can be somewhat dry, um, it does get more exciting as you get into uh, patient care and having one-on-one uh, -on -one, uh, patient care. It really changes things and you can sort of see what's going to be down the road. And then once you get uh, once you graduate and you start to have your own practice, there's nothing like having your own relationships with your own patients and determining how you're going to uh, set up your practice and the goals that you set for yourself. Very good. So it's very much worth it. A long road, but it's very worth it's it. It's important to love what you do. Thank you. Thank mm -hmm. you, Dr. Wenger, for Thank sharing you. your experience. I appreciate it. And we've come to the end of today's program. 
Thanks to our guest, Dr. Lori Wenger, and thank you for joining us. If you have any feedback or if any comments or if you would like to share your experience in your career, please email us at qip.career.choices at gmail.com. And we'll see you next time on Career Choices.